Well, good morning, church. How are we doing today? Well, um, I have learned something about myself. I like dogs. I do not enjoy owning one. <laughs> I got a video to show you to help you understand where that's coming from. Who did this mess? <laughs> Who did this? Cody, did you make this mess? Murphy, did you make this mess? Maggie, did you make this mess? Somebody made it. Who made it? Who made this mess? <laughs> uh, that's owned by America's Funniest Home Videos. That's fun. Um, I can just see it in the dumb dog's eyes the moment I walk in the door sometimes. You see that look. You know, we, we have to sing, we have to kind of like keep him in one area of the house because if we don't, he just destroys things, he pees on things, you know. But when I walk in the house and I see that look on his face, I'm like, okay, yeah, where did he pee? Um, what, did it, what, what did he destroy? Uh, or what did he eat that's gonna, that made him puke? Or the other thing? Or what did he eat that's going to eventually suddenly, spread, you know, out of nowhere, cause him to do either of those things? And uh, I just have just decided, I mean, he's great for the family, he's great for the kids, and we may always have a dog just for their sake or just for the sake of knowing I have a big dog at the house when I'm not there. But just in general, I've decided. I am love dogs. I just do not enjoy owning them. And I am really getting tired of that look. I used to think it was cute. Now it's just like, oh, what'd you do now, you know? It's interesting about that look, that look of impending doom about, oh, I'm in trouble because I did something I shouldn't have. I don't just see it on the dog's face. Um, when my son is coming out from the school with the teacher, you can just see it on his face, right? When my daughter is coming out um, of her school, and she's got this look on her face. And there's like, there's like sad Cadence face. And then there's like sad I'm in trouble Cadence face. And we find out that she, uh, she knew she had a test, but she, want, she didn't want to study for it. She wanted to like watch TV. So she lied about it. And then she failed the test, right? That look, right? I have even seen that look on my wife's face. <laughs> now, I remember this moment. I remember this moment. Uh, we had this CD player that we had installed into our first car that we ever bought, a little dumb little Saturn thing. And, uh, and I was saying, honey, you got to lock the door because people, because people come into the college where we were staying and they look for unlocked cars and they steal this stuff, right? And so I would, unlock, I would go open the door and it was unlocked. I'm like, honey, you got to lock the door. And then she walks in the house one day with that look on her face. I just went down to the car the CD player's gone, right? We've all been there. We've all been there. We've all had that look on our face at one time or another. This look of, I know something is coming. I don't know when, and I don't know what, but there's this impending doom because I know I've done something wrong, and I know it's coming to get me. The awful thing about God, <laughs> and I don't say that very often, is this feeling, right? Right? This feeling, because there is a God who, who's out there, he is holy, he has a way that he wants us to live, and when I make a mistake, it's an awful feeling to be thinking that this God that I can't see, that doesn't really talk to me necessarily, is a, probably upset with me, or upset with that I did this thing, and I'm kind of like looking over my shoulder, not going out when it's raining or stormy, because I don't want to get struck by light, you know, like this, this, this feeling that you can get sometimes, when, uh, when you've done something wrong and you think that God might be upset with you, okay? There's even a worse feeling, though. When you're going through a calamity or you're going through a tragedy or you're going through something difficult and the thought enters your head, this must be happening because I did something wrong. Has anyone ever been there before? Has anyone ever felt that way about God? I did something wrong. And because of that, now he is allowing me in, or, or forcing me to go through this, right? And as good Christians, right, we, we say, well, God does that because he's a good father. And good fathers discipline us. But at the same time, 
At the same time, there's just something not right about that. Luckily, today we're going to be looking at a scripture by, by Jesus that kind of clears all this up for us, okay? That clears all this up for us. Let's pray and let's start digging in. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day. Today, Father, we just simply ask that you would help us all to recognize our sin in our lives. No matter how great, no matter how small. And you allow us to, to, that you allow us, God, to come to you freely to seek forgiveness for that. I thank you for that, Father. But, Father, I pray that you would help us all to take the next hardest step, which is to turn and to repent and to walk away. Father, I just know that you have so much better in store for us. And so, Father, would that happen today? Would you help us all be ready and be prepared to turn, to continue to turn, to always be looking for another way to turn towards you and away from the way that we walk our, our lives by our sinful nature, Lord. So would you do that in this place? Spirit, put in the things that I'm missing. And I pray you would soften every heart that's in this room, that you would help me to say the things that you want to be said, Father, for you know us better than we know ourselves. So be in this place today and may you be glorified. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, Luke 13, starting in verse 1 is where we're going to be. Luke chapter 13. Uh, we have been going through the life of Jesus Christ and story by story. Uh, we've been in this series called He Changes it. He Changed Everything. And every time we come to a moment where he changes something, we stop and we look at it. And we, I mean, we've gone through all kinds of stuff where, where he's taught us about how we, he's, he's helped our understanding about God. Uh, so we stop sometimes and look at it from the perspective of a first century Jew, what they knew about God and how Jesus' words, what it would, how they would hear it and how that applies to our lives even today uh, in our culture. But every time we come to something where he changes our understanding, their understanding about God or how he wants us to live, we take a moment to stop. And, and uh, last week, uh, or, 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 or recently, that Jesus has been talking a lot about the end time stuff. You know, last week we talked about being ready for the second coming. That led on to a discussion about, uh, about the judgment of God and what that looks like. And, and as we look at the scripture today, you got to recognize that this is in context of Jesus talking about the end. Jesus talking about the impending judgment that is coming for all of us, okay? Because he's going to be asked a really interesting question and he's going to help us understand the mind of God when it comes to this kind of a thing of like, when I do something bad, does God punish me? Or am I going through something hard now because God is punishing me for this? Okay, Luke 13, 1 through 9. It says, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So Pilate had recently done something uh, pretty atrocious. Now, this whole mixing blood with the sacrifice thing, I know that kind of sounds kind of strange. So let me, let me give you a bit of a background here. Pilate was a really ruthless man. Now, he had this reputation of being incredibly ruthless. And, and when he first came in, when he first showed up, when he first came and took over, Pilate, remember, is the guy who hands Jesus over to, the, to be crucified. Remember that guy? He's the one who caved to the political pressure of the Pharisees, right? So he, he came in. When he first shows up with, his, with all of his soldiers and all that, he shows up with images, with imagery, and like banners and that kind of stuff, with this imagery that would have been very blasphemous and very upsetting and very idolatrous to the Jews, he shows up and he starts putting this stuff all over. And then he tells the Jews, he, th he threatens them with death if they try to protest these things. But he did it because he knew how much they would hate it. Now, the Jews being very pious are not going to put up with this. So they did start to fight back. They did start to protest and eventually he caved. Okay? We also see he's ruthless, but he caves pretty easily, apparently, I guess. But uh, then later on, there's another story about how Pilate actually took money from the temple, okay? So this is like money that people gave for God, for the poor, you know, to pay for the, for the priests and those guys. He took money from the temple to pay for an aqueduct, okay? And then when people protested, that time he did kill the protesters, Okay, so, he, so he's known as this really, really ruthless guy. And so this story that they're telling Jesus, they're telling Jesus about this story about how there are some Galileans. Remember, Ju Judea and Jerusalem are more southern. There's Samaria, and then there's Galilee. Okay, so, there's this, so Galilee is north of, of Judea. These Galileans came down to the temple, and they were offering sacrifices to the temple. Uh, Pilate heard about these Galileans who obviously were on the run from Rome, or they had done something wrong, and he came into the temple while they were worshiping, and he slaughtered them. 
So when he talks about the blood of, the, of these Galileans being mixed in with the sacrifices, that's what happened. And you see, the Romans had this, uh, had this tower that was right outside of the temple that went really, really high so they could see into the temple at any time. Can you imagine how, how the, the Jews just hated the fact that the Romans were there, the Romans were there and in charge and they were being taxed by these guys. They just hated it. They really believed the Messiah was going to come and free them from Roman tyranny, okay? And so imagine trying to worship and always having this reminder of this pagan country that was in charge. You're just waiting for God to come free you from this, from this uh, tyranny of, of the Romans, okay? And so, so they're coming to Jesus and they're saying, well, what about these Galileans? Because again, remember, in context, Jesus is talking about end time judgment stuff. They say, well, what about these Galileans? What is God's judgment? Was this God's judgment on the Galileans? Because they must have done something bad. Because can you imagine how awful that would be? You're coming into worship. You're coming in maybe to seek God's forgiveness for the thing that you've done. And here comes a soldier to slaughter you. Right? Can you imagine? So people are thinking, well, they must have done something really, really bad for God to interrupt, for God to allow these soldiers to come in and interrupt because they believe that, that at the, you know, all these things happen not as an accident but by the hand of God. Listen, and Jesus' response kind of gives us a hint that that's based on their question, that's what they're thinking. Jesus answered, do you think, verse 2, that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the Galileans because they suffered in this way? Well, of course, that's what they're thinking. That's why they're asking the question. They want to know, like, man, because they, did they, they must have done something really bad for God to allow them to be slaughtered in his temple, right? And because the Jews grew up with these stories about how God would, God would punish people for doing things that, that weren't right. David lost his son, right? David lost his son because he had adultery. And then the, and then the, the, the man... That, uh, that the husband, he killed the husband by sending orders with him to, to have all the other men step back in battle. You've heard that story? So, so, so because David committed adultery and, cre and uh, was a murderer, God allowed his baby to die. Moses didn't, even, didn't get to go into the promised land because he lost his temper, basically. Right? So the Jews grew up with these stories, that bad things are going to happen to you if you disobey God. That, and, and, and man, all you have to do is look at the Old Testament. There's all these, because you did this, I'm punishing you. Because you did this, I'm punishing you. Because you did this, I'm punishing you. And so they want to know, are these bad things happening because, our, of, of, because they must have done something really bad? I mean, there's like little things that are bad, but then there's really big things that are bad. Verse 3, here's Jesus' answer. I tell you, No. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. And he brings up another, another thing. Or those 18 who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? And apparently this is another story where a tower had fallen and, kill, and killed some people. Okay, Killed 18 people as this tower fell. And so the Jews were looking at this, natu like this, this calamity, and saying, well, those, those 18 people must have had it coming to them. And so God was punishing them in that way. Okay, so then there's, so there's I made this choice, and so this happened. Or, and so, the, so God allowed the soldiers to come in and kill them. Or I made this choice, and God caused the tower to fall on me. He says, no. Again, he says, I tell you, no. Verse 5, unless you repent, you too will perish. When tragedy hits, when calamity hits... It's very human for us to try to figure out why. And it's very human for us to want to point fingers at this is happening because of that. This is happening because of him. This is happening because of her. This is happening because of me. It's very natural for this to happen. And I, and I see it all the time, guys. As a pastor, I'm constantly in, in the room with people. When difficult things are happening, I'm constantly following up with people in the worst situations in life. Last week, I told a story about a young man who, who passed away. He, uh, he was in my youth ministry. He was a teenager, and he, he had a seizure, and he choked on his tongue. Okay. About a month after that happened, his dad called me. He said, Jeff, did God take away my son because I drink too much? And what do you say to that, right? 
um, a year after my friend Kyle. I've told this story many times about my friend Kyle who lost his 13-month-old baby boy to cancer. He called me up and he said, Jeff, did God take away my son because I was looking at pornography? When I was in college and uh, when I had a, a moment that I slipped back into, um, into looking, we hit a deer with our car. And the hardest part about that was wondering, if, is it my fault, right? How about, how about, how about the, you remember when those major earthquakes hit Haiti? Do you remember that, a major earthquake that hit Haiti? Do you know how many times I heard people say, well, Haiti's a very immoral nation and God is judging them. Do you know how many times I heard that? I know missionaries who, who uh, went to Haiti. It is incredibly immoral over there, incredibly. I mean, God, God doesn't show up a whole lot in any kind of way over there. So it's just interesting how it's really easy, especially, you know, especially if you grow up in the church, to have this thinking that if bad things are happening, it's because we've done, I've done this, or they've done this, or all this, and so this is God's way of punishing me. But i got to read it again. I tell you, Jesus said it twice, I tell you, no. Unless you repent, you too will perish. And so, see, people are looking, people are looking out, and they're trying to figure out, okay, this happened and so because, that happened because obviously this happened, right? They're trying to point fingers. And Jesus is trying to help them get above the, this, like, these momentary situations and, and help them see the, the biggest thing that's really the problem, which is their sin. In general, how we all are really struggling. We're going to talk about that in just a second, okay? But there's a reason. Why, do you know why we do this? Do you know why we're constantly looking? When we see these things, especially when they happen in the lives of other people, do you know why we're always looking to find an answer? Because, because if God is willing to punish them, if God is willing to punish them for something that they did, that means he's willing to punish me for something I did. And so what that does, here's, here's what this does. This thinking is very dangerous to your relationship with Jesus. Okay, here's why. Because if you think that's how God operates, one, it means you don't know the gospel. But, but if you think that's the way God operates, what that's going to leave you is that's going to leave you afraid of God, trying to earn your way into his love and respect in, in your life, right? And, and uh, earn your way into being left alone by him and not being punished by him. And it also, what it ends up leaving you is justifying yourself in the eyes of God. Okay, so it'll leave you afraid of God, trying to earn your good graces with God and justifying yourself before God. That sounds a lot like a Pharisee to me. That sounds a lot like a Pharisee to me. And the Pharisees are the ones that Jesus was always going after, right? People who understand, who have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, do not walk around looking over their shoulders, wondering if God is going to punish them. Okay, there is no fear. Perfect love drives out all fear, right? That's 1 John. 1 John talks about that. If you ever look at someone and say, well, this bad thing is happening because they probably did something bad. Or if you look at yourself and say, this bad thing is happening to me because I did something bad. God is punishing me. Now, there are consequences to your sin. That's a different subject, okay? There are things that you can do. There are consequences to your sin. That's a different subject. What I'm talking about is God taking out an extra punishment on you because you've done something bad. If you believe that, then you do not understand the gospel. Okay? I grew up in a church, guys. This thinking is very alive in the Christian church movement. It's fear-based. It's earning my love from God-based. Okay? And it's, I'm going to have to justify myself to make myself feel better about myself. That is not the gospel. Here's the gospel story. Okay? The gospel story is simple. You are separated from God because of your sin. And guess what? He hates it. Okay? He does. He hates your sin. And he is angry at it. Uh, in fact, a better word is, is he's filled with wrath because of that sin. Right? And because of our sin, we are separated from God is light. God is life. Right? Everything that he, that he is is life, love, and light. And we got separated from that. If you get separated from life and light, what are you left with? Death and darkness. And that is our world today. We are in death and darkness. 
But see, what Jesus did was he came to this earth and he never stepped outside of his father's will. He never stepped away from God. Therefore, he didn't deserve to die. He didn't deserve to have to face the darkness. But he went to the cross on our behalf anyways. That those of us who would believe, who would repent, which we're going to talk about more here in just a second. Those who believe and those who repent get to switch places with Jesus. And we get made right before God. He goes out into death and darkness and you come back into life and into the light of God. Okay, and that's, and that's where you are. Okay, it's pretty simple. If God were to punish Jesus for your sin, right? That was it. He took your punishment. Okay, atonement is what we call that. He atoned for you. Big churchy word that we don't really use in normal day language anymore, right? Okay, he atoned for your sin. He paid for your sin. He took care of the debt. He did, okay, that's, that's where he's at. For God to then come to you because of your sin and punish you again would mean he is an unjust God. That's like a debt collector coming to get your debt. And then you have someone pay your debt for you. They receive all that money and then yet they still come to you saying, you owe me. That's an unjust debt unjust debt collector. That dude's going to jail, right? Okay, so for us to believe that God punishes us because of our sin, even if we think it's because of discipline, okay, now there is this fine line, okay? There's this fine line between the fact that sometimes we make our own bed, right? Sometimes we make the bed we have to sleep in, and those consequences of sin are not a punishment from God, but simply the consequences of you deciding to walk away from him. And is he willing to let you sit in the consequences? You bet you he will. I will sometimes let my son sit in the consequences of his sin, right? He's, he's, being a, he's being a brat to his bigger brother, right? Who is the softest kid, you know, the most gentle boy in the world, right? And he will let, my, my, my middle boy will let my son just go after him, just go after him because he's so patient. Eventually, the bigger, older brother gets tired of him and pushes back. And he falls down and bonks his butt or whatever, and he's sad, and I'm just like, What'd you expect, pal? You're going to go to school and do that to some kid. He's going to leave you with a black eye, and I'm going to feel just as, uh, just as sorry for you in that moment, right? Guys, a good father will allow us to face the consequences of our own sin, but he is not going. You, we don't have to be afraid of him, okay? Because he is a just and a good father. And it is unjust church for us to look at people going through calamity and even in our heart of hearts say well they must deserve it we all deserve it we all deserve it the fact that we're not all going through the worst of calamities simply is a showing of the grace of God in our lives because guys we God owes us nothing he owes us nothing and there's this beautiful thing, if we would repent, okay? If we would repent, he says, listen, no, I tell you no. That's not how God works. More, but see, here's the more important issue. Y'all need to repent. Every single one of you needs to repent. Jesus is like, get out of the weeds, stop that thinking. That's not the way God operates. Here's how God operates. All of us, unless we accept, unless we ex repent of our sins, we're all going to be in trouble. Not necessarily having worried about a tower falling on us or something like that, but in the end, we're going to face this very real righteous God who hates sin. So you got to get that taken care of. Now, the beauty is, if you would believe and repent, if you would believe in Jesus and repent of your sins and be baptized, you are suddenly now in the light right before God. You don't have to worry about that stuff, right? But repentance, repentance is a tough issue, okay? Repentance is not an easy thing to do, okay? So what is repentance? What exactly does that mean, okay? Real quickly, I want to go through this, okay? First, there's, there's three, three big parts about repentance. The first, you got to recognize you're a sinner, that's the first step. If you, first thing, you got to recognize God is holy, I'm not. I stand before God one day. If I have anything on me that is, that is wrong, not right, he's going he's gonna to send me away from him. I'm going to be fully separated from him forever, right? So I, I, because of my sin, I need to become right with God. You've got to recognize that in your heart. I am a sinner is the first thing you've got to admit. Now, sin, keep in mind, sin is not an issue. Sin, God, it's not that God doesn't like sin main, just because it hurts other people. God doesn't hate sin just because it causes bad things in your life. God hates sin because it's just not right, okay? Sin issue is not an issue between you and other people. 
It has effects on other people. Sin is an issue between you and God. So in your heart of hearts, you've got to recognize that I'm a sinner, which is hard for some people to admit that I'm a, that I'm a sinner and that, I gotta, that God has a problem with me. Okay, But let me read this. It's so clear. Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away, and they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. This is Paul talking. Paul's the guy who spread the, the name of Jesus all around the known world. If, in, if you could be like Paul, well, you would be up here, not me, okay? Like Paul, one of the best of the best. And he's sitting there saying, none of us got it. Do you know who he's quoting? David. Who is David? David was David king, you know, but uh, the, the, the boy in the Goliath or whatever. But, but David was also known as the man after God's own heart, right? Again, if you could be like David, you'd be doing all right. But both David and Paul said, no, none of us got it. So the first step is to recognize I'm a sinner. Not because of what anyone else thinks, not because of what Jeff thinks, not because of what my parents think, but simply because God looks at me with sin in my life and says, that's a problem. You got to admit that. Second thing, the second thing is, you, is to confess that sin to God. Is to say, God, I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me of this? Uh, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The beauty of being purified of unrighteousness means that now you get to be right in front of God. Okay, so if you would confess your sins... That means like talking to God, really talking to God, saying, God, this is an issue in my life. This is an issue, and here's what I've done. For some of you, that's, that's another really hard step. Even just saying it in your mind, I've done this wrong. Okay, that can be incredibly difficult. God, I have done this wrong. Will you forgive me of my sins? Will you make me right? Will you purify me, God? Create in me a clean heart, God. David said that, right? So confess your sins to God. I'm going to put in a 2.5. I know I said there's three, but I'm putting in another one in between there. Confessing your sins to other people is a really good thing. Okay, Confessing your sins to others, fellow Christians, is a great way. If you have a hard time saying it to God, imagine how hard is it to say it to someone else. But if you can say it to someone else, if you can confess it to someone else, if you can have them pray for you, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible, James 516, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. My, my, my accountability partner that I've had since I was a, a sophomore in college, okay, since I was a sophomore in college, almost 15 years ago, we have held on to that verse and we hold on to that verse and we call each other when we mess up. And then we ask each other to pray for us. I tell you, I promise you, I have been healed so many times on so many levels because of that scripture right there. So confess your sins to God. But guys, let's, conf let's be a part of the church. Let's confess to one another. So because the prayers of a righteous person are, are, are powerful and effective, let's keep in mind a righteous person is not someone who does a lot of good. A righteous person is someone who's right before God. Okay? Here's the third one. And here's where the rubber hits the road, folks. Turn. You got to walk the other way. Turn from your sin. Acts 26, 20. Kind of a, an interesting, kind of weird verse. I'm not going to get into the whole history behind it. But listen, it says, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. So everyone, everywhere I've gone, I've preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Repentance un starts with your understanding. I'm a sinner and I'm in trouble with God. It goes deep into your heart when you recognize I gotta be right before God. And I gotta seek out this forgiveness and work on this relationship that I have with him. But then it's gotta move out into the hands, guys. It's gotta move out into the feet. It's gotta move into the way you live out your life. It doesn't just happen here. It doesn't just happen feeling sorry for your sin. It's a choice of changing life and it's gotta be shown by your deeds. It means I am walking one way and I repent. It means I walk the other way. It means to turn away from your sin. The beauty of this, one, is that God hates sin because he's God and he hates sin. 
But the things that he doesn't want us to do, he doesn't want us to do for our own sake. You think his rules are in there to like ruin fun or to make life difficult or whatever? No. Okay, that, that, that these things that he wants us to do and the way he wants us to live are for your benefit and for the benefit of those around you. Okay, the benefit is this life, guys, this life is not about you. This is not about you. It's not about what you think, what you want. It's not about that. This is about God and what he wants and how we can be a part of what he's doing in this world today. It's not about you. And so when you repent, it's not even just a thing to save your own tushy from going to hell. Right? That's not what repentance is about. Because your repentance and your repentance that is seen by your deeds is something that will spur on repentance in the church. And when repentance is found in the church, the world sees the church acting differently and they wanna know what's going on and they wanna be a part of it. And therefore, because the church changes, the world changes. Your repentance is something that God wants to do for you. Of course he does. You are a son, a daughter that he wants to bring home. But at the same time, he's looking at the thousands behind you that have yet to turn. So when you repent, it's not just for your sake. It is for the sake of those around you. I was just talking to a guy from Damascus where I didn't ask if I could tell him the story, so I'm not going to say his name. But I was meeting with him yes, uh, two days ago. You know what he told me? He said he came into Damascus way and he was going to fake it. He'd been in the cycle, in and out of prison, in and out of prison, in and out of prison. He, he came in with a determination in his heart. He was going to fake it. And he met one man, one guy who was taking it serious, one guy who he looked into this guy's life, saw a bit of himself in that man, but he also saw the change in this man's life. And he thought, I want that. He started coming to church. He started hearing about the goodness of God. He started doing what I tell you guys to do every week. Do you know that? <laughs> He started actually, I challenge you guys with application all the time. I know that many of you walk out the doors and you just completely forget about it. I understand. I was a preacher's kid, okay? I understand. But he actually goes and does this stuff, and he has seen tremendous fruit in his life. Enough fruit, not only that he saw it himself, but he was on the phone with his daughter the other day, and you know what, he, you know what she said? She said, Daddy, you're not the same man. You're not angry like you used to. You don't want to hurt people like you used to. You know what that's done in her life? She's getting help now that she's been needing for a while. And you know where she's finding it? She's, gonna be, she's, finding it, she's starting to find it in Jesus. My friend Russell, I mean my friend Kyle that I told you about, he has been a year and two months sober from pornography. Year and two months sober from pornography. And the work that he is doing, not only in his life, but in the lives of students, he, works, he helps out in the student ministry. The help that he is, that, that he is, that he is, uh, that he is giving in student ministry and to other guys in the church because of his ability to repent and to turn from his ways is not only changing his life, but he's helping make a change in the lives of other people. Okay, so when we look at tragedy, it's interesting, it's interesting how these things are connected. When you see someone going through difficulty, when you yourself are going through difficulty, And you start to look around wanting to point fingers at something. Jesus is like, listen, we all got to point inward first. All of us got to point inward first. Okay, anything else, anything else is unjust. We all got to point inward first and we all got to repent. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to, like, like Rick said, we're taking communion here at the end. We have a song that the band is going to play. They're going to come up here and, and the communion team is going to get the communion ready. While we're taking communion, okay, this is your chance. None of you are without sin in your life, guys. Now, God is not holding that sin against you, but none of you, like Christ, are completely 100% free of this sinful nature in your life, okay? You are at war. Romans talks about this, this war between the, ser- the spirit and the sinful nature in your life. That means there's a good chance this week you did something you shouldn't have done. That means you probably have had a moment where you did something or you thought something, or you said something or you, you know, whatever that you, that, that before God, God has an issue with that. 
Now, what I love about people who are new to the church, people who, who, who are struggling with, with addiction and that kind of a thing, what I love about that is that it's so easy for them to see what's, what's, what's going on. It's so easy for them to admit that I got an issue. It's my church people <laughs> that, that become so blind to the just, they're just little sins. They're just little sins. The little, the little expanding on a story, the little anger, the, I know, again, again, and this is just me speaking, the constant indignation, which we're talking about next week, the constant like indignation and, and upsetness that I feel towards other people, right? Like guys, we all have something today that we need to look God in the eye and say, God, I'm a sinner, and I need you to forgive me. But you need to take it beyond that. Guys, we all, all of us, doesn't matter how old, how young, it doesn't matter what life circumstance you are in, all of us should be able to look back to where you are now and say, this is how I am different. Okay? If you are the same person you were a year ago, okay, you gotta, <laughs> you're not Jesus, so that means you got something to work on. Ask for the Spirit to show you what is it He wants you to work on, okay? And then as you take communion, all of you are welcome to take communion as it comes. Commit that to God. Ask for His forgiveness. And then seek the strength and, the, this, and seek the Spirit's influence to walk away from that, okay? So this week, church, we're going to repent. We're going to repent. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, I thank you for how clear your word is. Thank you that your gospel removes so much fear. Thank you, God, that um, you love us and that sometimes things happen because we live in a fallen world. Sometimes, Father, I know you allow us to go through difficult things because you want to refine us, like James 1 tells us, but, but I'm just so grateful the simple message that if we all would just work on walking walk to, to you more and more, just walk into you more and more every single day, the potential that has to change this world. I know it's a change that, Jesus, you wanted for, these, for the people you were talking to that day. Lord, would you make that change come alive in us today? May we show it by our righteous deeds, the way you change us from the inside out. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for how you do that work. Now, it's not something that we can do all by ourselves, but you come with us and you join us and you take us along that journey. We thank you for that. It's in your name we pray. Amen.